What's up, Skins Nation? Welcome to another edition of Pink Skin Facts, History, and News. And once again, I'm your host, Fred Watson Jr. I got one question for y'all. Are you ready for some football? Are you ready for some football? It's kind of quiet in here, but I'll answer that. Hell yeah. Ready for some football. All right, well, let's get into it. I'm going to go to our trivia segment. Had some questions for, for you last week, and I told you I'd come up with the answers. Um, I didn't get receive any comments, but... In the future, for future reference, if you'd like to leave your comments, go down to the comment section. If you know the answers to any of these trivia questions, I like I would love to read them and uh, just give me your your thoughts, uh, ideas, whatever. OK, let's get into it. What was the first excuse me? What was the inaugural season for the Washington Redskins? Inaugural meaning the very first. What was the inaugural season? For the Washington Redskins. Answer. 1937. George Preston Marshall. Previously had his team in Boston. They were known as the Boston Redskins. Um, the previous years before 1937. And they played at Fenway Park. Then he moved his team to the nation's capital. And they changed their name from Boston Redskins to the Washington Redskins. So 1937 is the answer. Question number two, who was their very first opponent and what was the final score in that same season? Who was their very first opponent and what was the final score of that game in the 1937 season? Washington Redskins' very first opponent was the Cleveland Browns, the same team they'll be playing next Thursday night, the first preseason game. They played the Cleveland Browns and the final score was 16 to 7. All right. Third and final question from our last segment. Was Sammy Ball the first quarterback drafted by the Redskins? The legendary quarterback was Sammy Slinging, Slamming, Sam, la, 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 was Slinging Sammy Ball the first quarterback. Drafted by the Redskins. True or false? The answer to that question was false. Actually, I was shocked because I thought it was true. I thought Sammy Ball was the first quarterback. But actually, the answer to that was um, Riley Smith. Quarterback Riley Smith was the first quarterback drafted by the Washington Redskins. He played in Alabama, and he was drafted the previous year of the inaugural season, 1936. Quarterback Riley Smith. Okay, moving on. I have some more trivia questions for you for the next segment. And here we go. All right, first question. How many records does the former kick returner Brian Mitchell hold? How many records... Does former kick returner Brian Mitchell hold? I will have the answer to that on the next segment. And if you think you know the answer to that question, hey, go down to the comment, se comment section. Feel free to uh, give me your answer. And uh, I'd love to read it. Also, if this is your first time watching, welcome to the show. And uh, please, by all means, hit that subscribe button. Um, and for those that have already subscribed, I want to thank you. I say thank you to you and um, thank you for taking the time out to watch my show. And if you feel like you have any ideas or, or comments or thoughts that I can improve my show, um, feel free to uh, fill it out in the comment section. Um, I definitely welcome that and I'll, I'll look to it. So I just want to thank all of my subscribers out there. I appreciate you and much love to you. Skins Nation. Okay, second trivia question for our next segment. What year was former Redskins wide receiver Art Monk drafted? What year was former Redskins wide receiver 
Art Monk drafted. And the second part of that question is what college did he graduate from? I will have the answer to that on the next segment. Okay, third and final question. How many quarterbacks won in the three Super Bowls, 1982, 1987, and 1991? And what were their names or what was his name? Trick question. How many quarterbacks won in the three Super Bowls that they played in in 1982, 1987, and 1981? And what were their names or what was his name? I will have the answer to that on the next segment. So feel free to share your comments if you know the answers to these questions. And I will reveal everything in the next segment as promised. So once again, hit that subscribe button. If you like this show, hit a thumbs up. And uh, I thank you for your support. All right. Now we're going to go back in time. We're going to go to Redskins history. And we're going to go back to the year of 1969. Um, previous to those years, uh, the Redskins were a struggling franchise. Uh, they went through many coaches. They went through a lot of hardships. They went through many players. Quarterback great Sonny Jurgensen had just uh, joined the team a couple of years prior. He had came over from the Philadelphia Eagles in a blockbuster trade, and they also acquired uh, that famous linebacker, Sam Huff. So we're going to go to 1969. And there was a new coach. You probably heard the name before. There was a new coach that come over and he brought, actually he changed the culture in Redskins history because they were a losing team for many years prior to 1969. But he changed the culture and, and he, turned, he turned them into a winning franchise for the time that he was there. So let's go back in um, 1969. Here we go. The Redskins finished 7-5-2, their first winning season since 1955, and only their fourth in nearly a quarter century. What's more, the breakthrough took place under the direction of one of the NFL's all-time coaching greats, Vince Lombardi. Does that name sound familiar? If it does, then perhaps you watch the Super Bowl every year and you notice that trophy that they hoist up the champion hoist up at the end of the game, and it's known as the Lombardi Trophy. It's named after that legendary coach, the late Vince Lombardi. Here we go. Team president Edward Bennett Williams pulled off something amazing to sign Lombardi, a winner of two Super Bowls, five NFL titles, and 73% of his games as the Green Bay's coach from 1959 to 1967. After buying out the last two years of Otto Graham's contract, Williams made an enticing offer that lured Lombardi, Lombardi to Washington over other interested teams, including the Philadelphia Eagles, New Orleans Saints, Los Angeles Rams, and Boston, the American Football League, the Boston Patriots, and even the Naval Academy. The press reported that Williams persuaded the willow, widow of former Redskins acting president, Leo Orsi to sell 130 of the team's shares to the Redskins' other owners for $10,000 each. He then offered Lombardi a package of 50 shares of 5% ownership, the role of executive vice president, and a $110,000 salary. And for that time back then, that wasn't bad money. Hey, I take $110,000 now. The Packers, for whom Lombardi had served as general manager in 1968, released him from his contract. The hiring took the hiring was a chain effect across the nation's capital. And yes, the consummate winner had been recruited to stop the Redskins string of mediocrity and losing seasons. That St. Vince was so idolized amplified, amplified his arrival even more. The DC press dubbed it the second coming. So it was very big news. In that time for the nation's capital, they had a big name coach that was coming in and that was going to clean things up and that was going to turn the franchise around. Unlike the one ten and one Packers squad Lombardi inherited in 1959, the Redskins sported a strong nucleus. The offense, which in 1968 finished third in points, fifth in passing, yards in the NFL, possessed 
the firepower quarterback Sonny Jurgensen, receiver Charlie Taylor, and tight end Jerry Smith. Record-setting flanker Bobby Mitchell retired before the season. Also in place was a solid offensive line, which we need now, consisted of guards Vince Promoto and Ray Shinoki, center Lynn Hoss, and tackles Walt Rock and Jim Snowden, a defense that had been pathetic in recent years, nonetheless featured talents and safeties Brick Owens, Ricky Harris, quarterback Pat Fisher, linebacks, linebackers Chris Hamburger, Marlon McKeever, and defensive end Carl Kummerer. Lombardi knew that the cast would be insufficient to make the Redskins champion, so what he did was he reshuffled the roster. He changed it up. He came in and kind of had his own philosophy of how he wanted to do things. He signed free agents and quarterbacks Mike Bass, Ted Vactor, as well as Charlie Haraway, an undrafted running back, an excellent blocker who had played who had played three seasons in Cleveland. He also signed 11-year veteran quarterback Frank Ryan to back up Sonny Jurgensen. Lombardi also traded for several players he once coached in Green Bay, such as safety Tom Brown, defensive end Leo Carroll, and receiver Bob Long. By opening day, 19 of the 40 players who suited up for the Redskins' last game in 1968 were gone, including nine starters. So Vince Lombardi came in, and he cleaned up a lot of things, and um, that changed the culture from a losing team to a winning culture in Washington, D.C. when Vince Lombardi came upon the scene. Lombardi's first extended look at his squad came in training camp where he decided to keep three of the team's 14 draft picks. Oregon State All-American center John Dionon, Kansas State running back, running back, he was a star, Larry Brown. The 5'10", 195-pound Brown, a secondary ball carrier in college in the eighth round draft pick beat out 1967 first round draft pick Ray McDonald who was cut for the starting job. Brown's explosiveness made him the threat that the Redskins hadn't seen in years. A bona fide weapon in the backfield who could balance the potent aerial attack that they had. Sonny Jurgensen was was a gunslinger. He was a heck of a, a heck of a passer. The key to passing efficiency rested with Jurgensen who by training camp was delivering balls as crisply as ever after injuries hampered his release in 1968. Lombardi marveled at his right arm and threw a Hall of Fame inductee Bart Starr had quarterback the Packers during their glory years in the 1960s. The coach knew Jurgensen was in a different league in terms of sheer talent. Jurgensen is the best I've seen and he may be the best the league has ever seen, Lombardi once said. That's a compliment coming from a legendary coach. He hangs in there under adverse conditions. Jurgensen earned a super rating from Lombardi in the season opener at New Orleans. Their first game was against the New Orleans Saints. He completed 10 of 23 passes for 229 yards. With touchdown passes of 10 and 51 yards to Charlie Taylor and 13 yards to Smith as the Redskins recovered from a 10-0 deficit deficit to win the game 26 to 20. It looked like two in a row after Jurgensen's 13 yard scoring pass to Bob Long created a 23 20 lead over the defending Eastern Conference champion, the Cleveland Browns in the fourth quarter. Cleveland took possession on a 15 yard line with 124 left in the game with quarterback Bill Nelson hit Gary, wide receiver Gary Collins, who Pat Fisher had shut out all game for a touchdown. The conversion accounted for the Browns' 27-23 win. Unfortunately, the Redskins had lost that game. Larry Brown made his first major impact, rushing for 95 yards on 14 carries, including a 57-yard run. Very good. The next week, Sonny Jurgensen completed 27 of 39 passes for 258 yards and a touchdown in a 17-17 tie with the San Francisco 49ers that left the Redskins at one win, one loss, and one tie. Redskins kicker Kurt Knight, who beat out Charlie Gogolak in the preseason for the starting job, barely missed a 56-yard field goal with time running out that could have won the game, so they ended up tying. 
However, Knight was 4 for 4 in a 33 17 victory over St. Louis before a sellout crowd of 50,481 fans in a home opener at RFK Stadium. All right. It appeared that another Lombardi powerhouse was in the making when a 14 7 win over the Pittsburgh Steelers raised Washington's record to 4 1 1. But the Redskins captured one of their only next five games and struggled to keep pace with the Capital Division leading Dallas Cal Girls. Okay. After a 41 17 loss to the Colts and a 28 28 tie with the Philadelphia Eagles, the Redskins battled Dallas in another of their classic encounters. Sonny Jurgensen was brilliant for three quarters, throwing four touchdown passes that helped his squad erase a 17-point deficit and, and pull within 34 to 28 late in the third period. But he tossed three interceptions in the fourth quarter as the Dallas Cowboys pulled away for a 41-28 victory. I hate reading when we lose to the Cowboys, but it's history. Jurgensen was 24-35, 338 yards. Charlie Taylor caught six passes for 155 yards. And Smith, Smith hauled in seven passes for 98 yards, including 27, 29, and 11-yard touchdowns. So, moving on, the Redskins rebounded with a 27-20 win over the Atlanta Falcons. Sonny Jurgensen gave another seemingly tight performance, excellent performance, completing 26 of 32 passes, pretty accurate, for 300 yards. Haraway caught six throws for 110 yards, including a screen pass. He turned into a 64-yard scoring play that gave Washington a 24-20 third quarter lead. And Long caught 10 passes for 108 yards. And Brown topped the 100-yard mark for the second time. The Redskins were 5-3-2. And, and they ended up finishing the year 7-5-2, and two, second place in the Capital Division behind the Dallas Cowboys in 1969. And that was pretty much the history lesson. But it was a great, it was a great season. Um, that was the only season that Vince Lombardi coached the Washington Redskins. Um, he uh, left the team eventually, went into retirement. And I, I believe his death was, I believe he died in 1970, um, unfortunately. But uh, he, who the Super Bowl trophy is named after, was a legendary coach for Green Bay Packers. Of course, he's most well known there. He won five NFL titles, won two Super Bowls. But he came to Washington and he made history because he turned a losing franchise into a winner again. And in the 1970s, things turned around for the Redskins as they became more of a winning franchise. So kudos to the late, great Vince Lombardi. Okay. Wow. Now we're going to go to our shining moment and our gem of the day. And we have just that. It goes back to the year of 19... 66, November 27, 1966, and this was a game that was played that will go down in the annals of NFL history, and if I'm not mistaken, um, this game was, is, probably still is, I think, the highest scoring game in NFL history. The Redskins, on November 27, 1966, played the New York Giants in a game that displayed Offensive firepower and sloppy defenses on both sides. And the final score of that game was the Washington Redskins 72, the New York Giants 41. The 113 combined points stands as an all-time NFL record. So it is an all-time NFL record. And the 72 points by the Redskins is the best all-time tally in a regular season game. Only 70. Only the 73 points by the Chicago Bears when they shut out our team, 1940 championship was greater. 
we're not going to mention that. We'll leave that alone. So, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. No, we ain't going to talk about that. Okay, the team set a host of other league records before a boisterous crowd of 50,439 at D.C. Stadium, November 27, 1966. And among them was a combined touchdown total of 16 that remained first in NFL annals. The Redskins set an NFL record, 10 of those, seven on big plays, when they scored every kind of way. A.D. Whitfield's 63-yard run. Brig Owens' 62-yard fumble, fumble and interception returns. Ricky Harris' 52-yard punt return. Bobby Mitchell's 45-yard run and 74 and 32 yard catches by Ch T Charlie Taylor from Sonny Jurgensen. Ah, 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 I got tongue tied again. Who had a subpar personal day with 10 of 16 passing for 145 yards and three touchdowns. You would think that man probably passed the ball for 800 yards as many times as they scored. But they scored in so many different ways he didn't need to. So Whitfield also posted five and one yard scoring runs and Joe Don Looney bulled in from nine yards out. The Redskins led throughout and opened up a game high 34 point cushion, 62 to 28 in the fourth quarter. So basically the game was already over. So, um, you know, I bet there was like many yards in that game. The defenses were sloppy. The New York Giants. At that time in the NFL, they had the worst. They had the worst defense. I think it says they yielded a league high 501 points, and the Redskins' defense was uh, was was second, the second worst, and they they scored 146 fewer points than the 501 points that the New York Giants gave up in the uh, 1966 season. And uh, there was a interesting fact on that game. Um, like I mentioned earlier, linebacker Sam Huff. Uh, was traded, was let go by the New York Giants, and the Washington Redskins um, picked him up. And uh, he was, he was like, he was kind of, he was kind of bitter against his old team because the Redskins they led the game. It was sixty nine to forty one. Uh, it was like seven seconds left in the game, and they held, they held the ball. They had a first down on the New York Giants twenty two yard line, and what happened next? was pretty much up for debate. They could have ran the clock out and won the game 69 to 41. But Sam Huff, the defensive captain, um, even to this day, he insisted that they call a timeout. And he told the coach, um, Otto Graham, who was the coach at the time, um, the former quarterback, great quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. Otto Graham was now coach, coaching the Redskins in the 1966 season. He said, Sam Huff went to him. He said, coach, he said, show no mercy. He said, let's kick the field goal. And basically, uh, the coach was saying, Sam, the game's over. And Sam Huff was like, darn it, kick the field goal. And um, he said, kill the son of a boop, boop, boop. So Ali Sherman, the coach of the Giants, cut him. And Sam Huff pretty much held a grudge against the coach uh, of the New York Giants. He was He was upset about it. So he wanted to run the score up, basically, on his former team. He wanted to rub it in. And basically, uh, Graham eventually called the number of his kicker, Charlie Charlie Gogolik, and he booted the 29-yard field goal with seven seconds left, and it made the score Washington Redskins 72, New York Giants uh, 41. And Gogolik kicked nine straight to tie two players for the NFL season game record for most extra points, a mark that stands. So Graham was later asked why he sent Gugalak into the game. And the coach basically responded he needed to practice. So that was that was a that was a a funny response on a on an otherwise captivating day. But once again, that that's our gem of the day. Our shining moment, the Washington Redskins, 1966, November 27th, defeat the New York Giants in the highest scoring game in NFL history. 
72 to 41. And there have been getting, there have been uh, games that have come close to that total, but that that's a hard record to break. That's a lot of points, bro. So, moving on, we're gonna move on to the latest news. And first, we will start with um, there have been some signings on the Redskins signed a receiver by the name of Dez. Could it be? Is it? Could it be? Is it Des Bryant? No. No. Uh, they signed wide receiver Des Stewart. Uh, it's a free agent, six foot two, two hundred pounds. He's from a dis- Division two school, uh, Ohio Dominican University. So they signed another wide receiver. Redskins also signed, if you already heard, uh, left tackle Donald Penn, a former two-time Pro Bowler from the Oakland Raiders. And basically, he will be plugged in at the spot uh, held by Trent Williams uh, unless he comes back. Um, but barring right now, I just don't I don't see it happening um, concerning his relationship with the Redskins. Um, it's not looking good. So they, they went and did the right thing. They're learning. They went out and got a left tackle, uh, Donald Penn. 36 years old, two-time pro bowler, still has a little bit left in the gas tank. So basically, they'll have him ready to go and plugged in at this spot that uh, Trent Williams held at left tackle. They also signed offensive lineman Hugh Thornton, um, who'll be probably playing guard. They'll probably plug him in at guard somewhere on the line if needed uh, as a backup, I guess. Redskins uh, released Casey Dunn, offensive lineman Casey Dunn was released. So Dunn is done. He's out of there. Uh, Any more releases? Let's see. I believe that is it as far as the recent signees. Uh, Also released. He was involved in a fight the other day, uh, which I'm going to mention. Tyler. Offensive lineman Tyler Catalina, who was involved in a fight, was released recently. So there were there was uh, two fights at training camp. I believe it was this past Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, one of those two days. Sorry, uh, two fights broke out at training camp. You know, hey, temperatures hot out there. The players, they're practicing, they're going up against the same person every day. You know, there's a lot of testosterone out there. You know how it is. Alpha males going at each other. You know, it's competition. There's going to be fights. It's going to happen. It's tension in the air. You know, it's training camp. These guys are probably doing two-a-days. So, hey, it's going to happen. So, probably what happened, what happened, excuse me, uh, there was an incident between defensive lineman JoJo Wicker and offensive lineman Tyler Catalina. There was a shoving match between the two, and, you know, they got into it. And after the play, Catalina threw a punch toward Wicker's face mask, and then some more shoving ensued on the play. And afterwards, defensive tackle Tim Settle flies in out of nowhere, comes flying from the side, and knocks Catalina to the ground, and they have a wrestling match. Two plays later, safety Monte Nicholson and tight end Jeremy Sprinkle they get engaged in a little in a little spat after the whistle. So Sprinkle ended up on the ground, ends up on the ground. Uh, Monte Nicholson stands over him, refusing to move. Then Jeremy Sprinkle jumps back up and tackles Monte Nicholson. And then after the and then after the practice, he goes in the comment. He said, "Hey, we didn't mean it out here." Sprinkle said of the altercation. He said, "That's my boy. Stuff happens." That's practice. Alpha males going at it. Tension in the air. Hey, temper slayer is going to happen. So at the end of the day, they still boys. So cool. No harm, no foul. All right. Also, linebacker John Bostick, who was signed by the Redskins on May 22nd, a couple months ago, several months ago, a couple months ago. Uh, he was released, you know, by the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was a former second-round draft pick. 
in 2013. He came out of the University of Florida. He's been with five teams. Uh, played his first three years with the Chicago Bears, the Patriots, Detroit Lions, Indianapolis Colts, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And basically, he was brought here to fill in because Ruben, Ruben Foster was hurt uh, the very first day of practice uh, towards ACL. So they brought in they brought in John Bostic, who was a very, very tough linebacker, very, very intelligent player. And Mason Foster was released. So John Bostic is now calling the play for the defense. And um, I look forward to seeing him play this year and, and lead the linebacker core um, in the defense. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that front, that, that, that front four because we got some we got some head crushers up front. We do. And um, our secondary, we got the addition of Landon Collins, of course. I'm really, really looking forward to see how our defense has matured from last year to this year. You know, of course, last year we started out great. We were at number five at one time in the NFL and defense. And then it kind of, you know, things kind of fell apart a little bit as the season went on. But I'm, I'm looking for the maturity of the defense this year. I'm really looking to see the improvement and see how well we did, see how well we'll do during the course of the season. I believe that we will have at least a top 10 defense. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. And also, just want to add another thing. Hell yeah. There was an article in the Washington Post on Tuesday about an undrafted rookie tight end who recently signed with the Washington Redskins, and his name is Donald Parham. Freak of nature. Six foot eight inches tall, a rare commodity in the NFL. Six foot eight inches tall. He has a seven foot wingspan and he's a long shot to make the roster um, with the likes of Jordan Reed, Vernon Davis and Jeremy Sprinkle already have a spot, a field spot as tight ends on the roster. But perhaps this Parham guy, he can impress during training camp and make, make the practice squad. Who knows? You know, I think every NFL team has a player that just shows up out of nowhere. Talented, super talented, gifted, raw, needs development, but they come in and impress. I believe every NFL team probably has a prayer, a player, excuse me, a player that comes in out of nowhere that that can make the team. You know, you never you never know. You gotta give it a shot. You never know what'll happen. But this guy, he's pretty impressive. Uh he played at Stetson University. He's from I believe he's from Florida. Uh, I got it somewhere in here in an article. I think he's from Florida. But anyway, um, he has a chance to impress during training camp and make the practice squad. And they they did some some drills in the red zone, and this guy was catching the ball effortlessly. They were throwing a, they were putting the ball up to this guy, and this guy was just snatching the ball without really having a jump. I mean, six foot eight, come on. The guy has a seven foot wingspan. So what does that tell you? So anyway, Jordan Reed, he left a comment and he was impressed by this guy. And he, he said, quote, unquote, man, he's an athletic dude. He has all the ability in the world. So the coaches are polishing him up and he has the potential to be a great player. Jordan Reed shook his head in, in disbelief and said he's got long arms. Reed continued and he said, even when a guy's in his chest, he can still reach his arm up and make a catch. It's hard to stop him. Um, the guy can catch the ball. He doesn't even have to jump. I mean, that's impressive. Six foot eight, a tight end. This guy should be playing basketball. He's from Lake, Lakeland, Florida, a former basketball player in high school. There it is. At the time, he was six foot seven, 200 pounds, and he turned into a tight end. His junior season in college at Stetson, he caught 85 passes for 1,319 yards, 13 touchdowns, and only nine games. Many of those catches, they said he lined up as wide receiver to create mismatches. He's a freak of nature. He runs a 4-6 and a 40. He has a 7-foot wingspan, and he has a 36-inch vertical leap. Wow. Wow. 
last year he led Division I college football, both the football bowl subdivision and lower tire football championship subdivision where Parham averaged 9.4 catches and 146.6 yards a game. Wow. That's phenomenal. That is from I've I don't think I've ever heard of anybody that catches nine catches a game and averages 146 yards. Come on, man. This dude, this dude is a freak of nature. I'm 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 interested and I'm I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna keep watching this guy, and I hope he does make the practice squad. Better than that, I hope he makes the team. Six foot eight. Yo, we can use that in the red zone. Skins Nation, you know you you gotta agree with that. We can, we need that. <laughs> so, all right, fans, that's the end of our segment. Skins Nation, I love you. We're gonna do it again. We're getting close to football season next Thursday. Don't forget, first preseason game next Thursday night. I believe it's eight p.m. August eighth. Washington Redskins take on the Cleveland Browns and all four preseason games will be televised on NBC4, the NBC Sports Washington Network. And in case you work and you miss that game and you have NFL Network, they'll be showing the replay game on August 9th at 4 p.m. in case you missed it. So uh, pregame coverage for that game starts at 7.30 p.m. next Thursday night, NBC4. And be forward, be looking forward to watching that. Skins Nation, I love you. Hit that subscribe button. Leave your comments. And we'll see you next time. Peace.